Welcome to Bible Study Hub. I'm Ann Wiggins, and I'm so glad to be with you tonight. We go verse by verse through the Word of God, and it sure does transform our lives. So we've been in the Gospel of John for quite some time. We've actually been off for a few weeks. I was on vacation a little bit, and um, then last week I was working. So we're just happy to be back together again. And we're going to pick up in John chapter 3 tonight, where we left off last time. The story of Nicodemus is where we left off. Tonight we are going to hit arguably the most famous Bible verse ever in the New Testament particularly, and that is John 3.16. And I have a feeling that when we kind of put it in the context of this chapter of John, that it is going to take on a richness and an understanding that will just make you love that verse even more and will make it even more meaningful. So last time we left off, Jesus and Nicodemus were having a conversation. If you don't remember Nicodemus or you weren't there for that Bible study, he was considered, in fact, Jesus calls him this, the teacher in Israel. He was a Pharisee. And so he came to Jesus at night, which was not unusual. They would have conversations in the cool of the evening at nighttime. So it wouldn't have been unusual to have this type of situation come up. So he, he goes to Jesus. And he says, we know that you are from God because nobody could do the things that you're doing if God were not with him. And it's as if Jesus takes that comment and just chucks it and says, unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. It has nothing to do with what Nicodemus just said to him. It was kind of like Nicodemus was doing the nicety, sort of the chit chat, and Jesus just cut straight to the, to the chase. So... We said last time that this whole concept of being born again was not unusual either in that culture. It was kind of a, an, an expression that they would use, maybe an idiom we might call it. So if, say, a man got married, they would say he was born again. And all that meant was your life is completely different now from what it was prior to marriage. Or if somebody were to, say, convert from paganism to Judaism, they would say that person was born again. And all that meant was nothing is the same. It's totally different from the old life of paganism. So when Jesus tells the number one Pharisee, the most pious man in Israel, the one that everybody would have looked to to say, if anybody is good enough to go to heaven, it has to be Nicodemus. I mean, he's like the number one Pharisee, the best teacher. And Jesus says, if you're going to see the kingdom, if you're going to go to heaven, you have to be born again. You've got to stop everything you're doing and start completely over again. And he blows Nicodemus's mind. So Nicodemus, in like fashion, says, how am I supposed to go back into my mother's womb and start over again? He doesn't mean he actually thinks Jesus is telling him that. He's just talking like apples to apples. You're going to talk about being born again. I'll talk about being born again. And so basically just saying, I don't even know how I would do something like that. Like, what? <laughs> you can just see the wheel spinning in his mind. He, does, he just doesn't even know what to say. So Jesus ends by saying, basically, fleshly things produce fleshly things and spiritual things produce spiritual things. And so he's working him into where we're going to pick up this evening. So if you have your Bibles, that's your intro. Turn to John chapter three. This is the gospel of John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. If you are at the end of your New Testament, you're in probably first, second, or third John, written by the same author, but that's not where we are. So go left and get to the gospel of John chapter three. And let's pick it up tonight in verses 11 to 13. So let me pop these up and we will read these together. And here's what it says. Jesus goes on to say, truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness of what we have seen. And you do not accept our witness. If I told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? And no one has ascended into heaven, but he who descended from heaven, the son of man. So Jesus really is confronting Nicodemus on his unbelief at this point. He, could, he just goes on to say, if, if you're not able to believe and understand the things that are right in front of you, the tangible things, how do you expect to understand spiritual things that you can't see? Probably those words aren't going to make a lot of sense to you. And then he kind of goes on to say, 
none of your earthly teachers, the ones who brought you up and, and you were under their tutelage, none of them have been to heaven, but I have. I descended from heaven. The Jews did not believe in, in reincarnation or uh, pre-existence before birth, which is correct. You, you exist at the moment of conception, not before, but then you will exist forever after that. Uh, so Jesus is saying, um, you know, this is something that only I can possibly know because I'm the only one who actually pre-existed my own birth. I was in heaven, so I can speak to these things. I've been there. So poor Nicodemus, Jesus is, is taking all his cards off the table. He is really, really unsettling him. So I have to ask you, are you tracking with this at all with Nicodemus? I mean, maybe this is kind of you. Maybe you, you figure people around you, if, if they were to be asked, like, who do you think would definitely make it to heaven? You know, that that hopefully your friends would be like, oh, well, well, she would or he would. I mean, they're a really good person. Is that something that registers with you? Is that what you think about yourself or is that what other people think about you? Um, maybe you're like, I'm, I'm better than the next guy. I mean, the general public doesn't do nearly what I do. I, I don't do that many bad things. I'm a pretty good person. I'm a pretty good outwardly. Well, Jesus has some more to say to Nicodemus about that very thing. What happens to a person who is depending on what they do, their good works, their piety, their church attendance, how much they give, how much they read their Bible, how nice they are, all of those things. If, if that's you going, oh, yeah, like, I thought that's what you had to do to go to heaven. Please don't leave me. Stick with me because Jesus has a message for Nicodemus, for you, and for all of us. So let's pick it up. We're going to do verses 14 to 16. So we're going to capture John 3, 16, but we're going to do it in the context of verses 14, 15, and 16. So here's what Jesus goes on to say. This is fascinating, by the way, fascinating. I'm going to explain all this, so, so hang with me here. He says, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, so that whoever believes in him will have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. I wrote in my notes, uh, John 3, 16, it just puts a smile on our face. It's a familiar verse. It's a comforting verse. It's a verse that we hear a lot or, or you see on signs at baseball games and things people will hold up, John 3, 16. But you rarely hear people talk about the verses around John 3, 16. And just remember, when John wrote his gospel, he just sat down and he just wrote it. There were no chapters. There were no verse numbers. He just wrote it like you would write a normal book. Later verses and chapter headings and all of those things came into play. So this was all meant to be read and understood together. There's a concept in our culture and very prevalent in something called progressive Christianity, if you're familiar with that. It's, uh, it's really not Christianity at all at its heart. It's quite pagan, but it incorporates a lot of elements of Christianity to make it a little foggy and a little bit um, harder to, to draw out like what's real and what's not. But this is the concept, is that God loves everybody. He would never send anybody to hell. God is love. God so loved the world. He gave his son for everybody. And so that means, they will tell you, everybody eventually gets to heaven. Some will say, well, if you're just sincere, like even if you are a completely different religion, not even a Christian religion, some, some Middle Eastern or New Age or, or Scientology or whatever, as long as you're working your hardest, as long as you're doing your very best, God understands, you know, he'll accept you. They'll, they'll say things like that. Or they'll say, well, yeah, some people reject God, but God is a God of love. 
he's not going to let anybody end up in hell. So eventually, even if it's after they die, salvation will be offered to them and they'll receive it and everybody will end up in heaven. That is absolutely from the pit of hell. That is not what the Bible teaches. And it's why we say often it's not a good idea to take a little piece of scripture, a verse, a portion of the verse, pull it out, and then develop a whole big theology on that one little itty bitty piece. You need to have the whole of it to make sure that you're balanced out and that you understand what it really is saying. So let's look at the context here because it really informs what the passage is trying to teach us. Jesus here is referring to a story, as I'm sure you guessed because of the reference to Moses, from the Old Testament. This is a story from Numbers 21, a fascinating story. I remember as a little girl in Sunday school, from time to time, you know, they would take us through various stories and this one would come up. And I was always so intrigued by the snake story. So here's the background on all of this. If you were with us in the book of Exodus when we studied that, you know that the children of Israel were crossing the wilderness on their way to the promised land. Before we got to that, we, we switched gears and we went to the book of John. But if you keep reading through the rest of Exodus and then into Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, you will see that their, their spies, when they finally got to the land, they sent in spies to, to scope it out because they were going to take this land that God had promised them and had brought them out of Egypt and taken care of them in the wilderness. And the spies came back. And most of the spies said, we can't do it. There's giants out there. They're going to crush us like grasshoppers. It's a bad situation. Oh, yeah, the land is beautiful. We'll never get in there alive. We're going to get taken out. And only two of the spies, Joshua and Caleb, came back and said, no, no, no. God said it was ours. He's going to be with us. We can do this. With God's help, we're going to be victorious. Let's go get it. Let's go. And the people went, well. And fell apart and cried and said, we can't do it. We don't want to. Why did you bring this out here? We would have rather been in Egypt, blah, 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 the normal. And so God said, that's enough. I've had enough of that. You know, you can cross a line with God where he does come to the end of his patience. And he did. And so he said, this whole generation will have to wander around in the wilderness for 40 years until all of you are gone. And your children will be the ones to go into the promised land. So off you go. Go do your wandering. And so for 40 years, until they were all gone, they were dropping like flies in the wilderness. They were not permitted to go into the promised land. So the Numbers 21 story occurs kind of at the end of that wilderness time. So most of those people are gone. But the children obviously have been born and raised in the wilderness. Some of them might be almost 40 years old by this time. They are the generation to go into the promised land. And wouldn't you know it, they are just little chips off the old blocks. And so they say to Moses, I mean, like they're almost there. <laughs> they're almost to the end of the 40 years. Well, we don't like this food. You brought us out here to die. There's not enough water. And they, and they start accusing Moses of trying to kill them, basically. And again, God just says, cross the line, didn't you? You just had to be like your moms and dads and your grandparents. So the story goes on that God raised up snakes out of the dirt, like these snakes came out of the ground. Did God spontaneously make them out of dirt? I don't, or were they just under the ground? We, we don't really know. But you can picture the scene. All of a sudden, snakes everywhere. How many of you, that is your worst nightmare? <laughs> I actually kind of like snakes. I don't really want to touch them, but they don't scare me like they do some people. A lot of things scare me. Lace can be scratchy. I'm kind of scared of lace. Arm seams can be kind of atrocious on your arm sometimes. I have sensitive skin. So I worry about those things. But snakes, not so much. But I will tell you this. If they're poisonous snakes, I am highly concerned about them. And these were. So out of the ground come all these snakes. And they start biting the people. And the people just start dropping. They're dying. 
And I'll tell you what, they repent in record time. Off they go to Moses as they are just falling, 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 falling. These snakes coming out, biting them. And they say to Moses, um, we have sinned against the Lord. Would you please go talk to him on our behalf and tell him we're so, 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 so sorry. And would he please take the snakes away? So Moses, being the incredible leader that he is and so compassionate and kind, goes to God and says, God, the people have repented. They would like to humbly ask you to take away the snakes. And God interestingly says, I'm not going to take away the snakes, but here's what I will do because he is compassionate and rich in mercy. He says, Moses, I want you to make a snake. I don't think he instructs them what to make it out of if, if my memory serves me right, but Moses ends up making it out of bronze. So this must've taken him a little while to make it. He says, I want you to make a snake and I want you to put it on a pole. And anybody who looks on that snake will not die from the snake bites. And so Moses does this and he puts the snake on the pole and all the people who look at the snake hanging on the pole, the venom does not kill them. Everybody who does not, they die. Fascinating story. Like, what is that about? And, and you know, you hear that and you, you probably, as I did, and I, this is where I would kind of get hung up as a child, like, isn't the snake kind of a representation of sin and Satan? <laughs> And the people had to look at that, like, why did he not put like a lamb on a pole? I could see that, you know, or some other sacrifice on a pole and have them look at that or, or look at the tabernacle where the presence of God was. But why a snake on a pole? Well, here's the reason why. Because when Jesus hung on the cross, he who knew no sin became sin for us. In other words, he didn't become sinful. He never sinned. He was never intrinsically evil at all. But he took onto himself the sin of the world. So when it says, when God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, when Jesus hung on that cross, he took that sin. This is looking ahead. So they had to look at the very thing that was killing them in faith and believe what God had said. And if they did that, God would heal them. Now, you might also be thinking to yourself, as I did, well, that just seems kind of like way too easy. Like, all you have to do is look at the same, like, who wouldn't do that? You know, just glance up there. But you have to understand, we've got well over a million people here, maybe more than a million. And so it's not like it's a small group of 15 and there's a snake in the middle and they have to do is raise their eyes. They've got to somehow get to wherever the snake is because it's a huge, huge encampment. And you can also imagine that there would be, I mean, they didn't have signs like we do today, but there would be those who would be like, do a tourniquet. You know, that's what you do for snake bites or get get some, some sharp object, get just try to get the poison out. You know, we can handle this. We can do it. We don't need to drag these people, you know, half a mile to the snake when they're in pain. Just do the tourniquet, get the sharp object, Get we'll get the venom out ourselves. And I'm sure that that was happening too. So these people did have to put aside their own ideas, their own, this always worked for me before, this own, I can handle this. And they had to go drag themselves half dying to put their eyes on the snake and be obedient to what God said and believe that he would heal them. So here's, here's Jesus's message to Nicodemus. That's all the background. By the way, would Nicodemus have known that story? Oh my goodness. A hundred percent. He would have probably memorized it word for word because the best teachers memorized all five books of the, the Torah, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. How did they do that? I can barely memorize a verse and these people have whole books memorized. So yeah, he, he totally knew that. But here's, his, here's what Jesus was trying to tell him. He says, Nicodemus, I embody that story. That story of the snake on the pole that they had to look at in faith, that's about me. That's what's going to happen to me. Jesus took the guilt and the sin of us on himself. So the people in the wilderness were guilty of sin. But if they looked at the snake, 
God would forgive them. We ourselves are guilty of sin, but when we look on Jesus in faith, God will save us. So John 3.16 is not a marshmallowy, soft, squishy verse about the nebulous love of God and how he loves everybody and everything's going to be fine and okay. It is in the context of severe judgment and the wrath of God on people deservedly because they sinned. That's what the context is for John 3.16. So this is, this is my little paraphrase of it. This is how I would say it. God loved the world so much, he gave his only son. And whoever looks at him in faith or believes on him will, instead of perishing, as the Israelites did because of their sin, receive eternal life. That is how Nicodemus would have received that. The way that they got the curse removed was through their belief and their eyes on exactly what God told them to put their eyes on. This is operating in 100% faith. That's what this verse is all about. And this is how God loves the world. Does God love the world? Yes, absolutely. He sent Jesus to save every single solitary person who would ever believe on him. The, the gospel is open to absolutely anyone and everyone. It doesn't matter how good you are. It doesn't matter how wretched you are. If you come before God with faith in him for salvation and repentance and, and sorrow for your sin, and you cry out to him and beg him to save you, he will do it. It doesn't matter what your past is. This is how God loves us. Romans 5, 8 says, but God demonstrates, he shows his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's how God loves us. There's a little quip that I hear a lot in evangelical circles. Maybe you've heard it. Maybe you said it. Maybe I said it. I don't know. But here's what it says. God loves you just the way you are. Have you heard that? Has anybody ever said that to you or to somebody that you've been around? God loves you just the way you are. It's not my favorite saying for the reasons that we just discussed. The implications of saying that to somebody kind of give them the impression of, you know what? It doesn't matter. God loves you. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to change. You don't have to repent. You don't have to be sorry. He just loves you just the way you are. He, he does love you just the way you are. That's the problem. But it's more like he loves you in spite of the way you are despite the way you are, despite the way I am, not because of it. He's gracious and kind and compassionate and rich in mercy. And that is how he loves us. He never looks at our sin and says, oh, not a problem. I don't even mind. I don't even notice. Sin is never flippant to God. But because of what Jesus did on the cross, he took the wrath. He took the snake bite that I deserve, that you deserve, onto himself. He took the wrath of God. He paid the penalty I legally owed for my sin. And because that has been applied to my life, God looks at me and sees me covered in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Wow. That's what that verse is all about. Well, Jesus goes on to talk even more about judgment. We've got more judgment to come. So let's keep going here. Verses 17 to 18 says this, For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. He who believes in him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of of the only begotten Son of God. 
the grace and mercy of God delays his judgment on us. However, as I said a minute ago, we can get to a point where we cross a line and it is, that's the line and God will act at that point. But my goodness, his love and compassion and long suffering is just mind boggling. I have a question for you. So go ahead and uh, start typing. And I'll just let you know up front, a lot of my questions are kind of a, what do you think sort of thing? So there's no right or wrong answer. This one actually has a right or wrong answer. And I only tell you that not because I don't want you to participate, but I just don't want anyone to be like, oh, so embarrassed, I got it wrong. Do, do Just do your best. I just am curious to see what you say. Do you think we are born sinners or do we become sinners as an outward, like, expression of things that go on around us. In other words, when you're born, are you born a sinner or do you become a sinner? You were born innocent, but you become a sinner later. Love to hear your thoughts. I am going to run over to the comments and um, a lot of people just saying hello. <laughs> yeah. I, I had a big traffic backed up tonight when I was trying to get to Bible study. So I was a little late if you're watching later. Um, Let's see here. Uh, thank you, Amy, for your very kind words. Very, very kind. Um, let's see here. All right, here we go. Susie says, we are born sinners. All right, so one vote for born that way. Two votes for born that way. Carolyn says, we were born sinners. Good. Dottie says, born with a sin nature. Um, Amy says, become a sinner, temptation. All right. I'm glad that we have both going on. I was kind of hoping that we would. All right. Thank you, Amy, for that. Emily says, check with a two-year-old who's probably not been taught to hit, <laughs> bite, push, etc. Born with a sin nature. Hate it. <laughs> yeah. I remember um, when we had my daughter. Thank you for your comment. Oh, here's a, a few more. Christine said, uh, I feel we are born a sinner. All right. Thank you so much, Christine. Yeah, when I had my daughter uh, 20, what is she now, 25 years ago, and there was a sweet lady at our church, and I was holding my newborn baby daughter, and you know, the babies are just, they are, they look so innocent and so sweet, and she said to me, enjoy her while she's just like Jesus, and uh, I was like, what? <laughs> what did you just say? She goes, yeah, enjoy them while they're just like Jesus. I was like, what? What do you mean by that? She goes, well, you know, because someday she'll have a sinful nature, but right now she's totally innocent. I don't want to make her feel embarrassed, so I didn't correct her. But I just want you all to know that the Bible makes clear that we are born with a sinful nature. In other words, we're born sinners. This is hard. This is hard to hear, but it's true. I am under the condemnation of God aside from the salvation of Jesus Christ. If I put that on the side, I am under the condemnation of God. It's not just because of what I do. It's because of who I am. Because my nature is to oppose God. It is my nature to sin against him. It is my nature to be self-centered, self-consumed, unkind, mean, all of it. That's what I do. It's who I am. I come with that. You come with that. If you look at the verse in 1 Corinthians 15, 22, it says this, for as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. Here's what this verse is saying. You inherited a sin nature from Adam. Therefore, in Adam and you are and I am, if you trace my lineage back far enough, not that we would be able to, but if we could, it ends with Adam and Eve. That's where it ends. And that's where yours ends too. So we have that sinful nature. So what he's saying here is through one man, sin came into the world through everybody. But conversely, through one perfect man, all will be made alive in Christ Jesus. So Adam gave us a sin nature and Jesus comes and takes that sin nature off the table for us in eternity. Right now, we still, we still fight it. 
Even if you know Jesus, you know you're not perfect yet. You still fight that sin nature on the side of heaven. But someday, if Jesus is your Lord and Savior, someday that will be gone. And in Christ Jesus, we will be made fully alive without any constraints of sin, without any sin nature. Did you ever think about the fact that if, again, you're in Christ and, and you are in heaven someday, it will be 100% you with no sin? Sometimes I try to think, I hope there will be some semblance left of who I am right now. Like, I feel so sometimes burdened down by my sin nature. I feel so consumed by fighting my impulses day in and day out all the time that that's so part of the fabric of my personality and who I am. What will I be with all of that removed? Only the good parts left. I hope there's some good parts left, but that's an interesting thing to think about. So judgment is the default, but grace and mercy make a way of escape. The next couple of verses detail kind of how and why God judges people who do reject Jesus. So let's keep going here. By the way, thanks for hanging in. I know this has been a lot already. We're almost done. This is what these say. And this is the judgment that the light has come into the world and men love the darkness rather than the light for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light lest his deeds be exposed. But he who practices the truth comes to the light so that his deeds may be manifested as having been done by God. That is the human condition. You either love the light and are attracted to Jesus or you hate the light and you push him away. Over the weekend, I think it was, I had a really, really busy weekend and it was wonderful because I was almost completely off of social media, mostly because I didn't even have time for it. I got to go down and visit my, my son. He's 23, North Carolina, just bought his first house. We did give him a cent. He did it all on his own. I was so proud of him. And he had a housewarming party. And so we we couldn't miss it. So we, we loaded up on Friday morning after my work and we drove the distance down to North Carolina. Did I just say South? If I said South, I meant to say North Carolina uh, for his, his housewarming party. And then we drove back on Sunday. So it was just one of those whirlwind weekends. So I was completely outside of the whole social media thing. And it was a lovely break. I highly recommend it once in a while. But once we got back on the road and I kind of like got my phone out and started to figure out what I'd missed in the world, I realized that the opening ceremonies for the Olympics, as you probably heard, uh, this is July 2024, if you're watching this back later on, featured um, a drag queen portrayal of what appeared to be the Last Supper. And it was the most blasphemous, horrendous thing I have probably ever witnessed in my life. My jaw was on the ground. And I will tell you in no uncertain terms, I was irate. I was furious. And it was a right, for all the talk about how sinful I am, I feel that this was a righteous, holy anger because of the mockery of my Lord Jesus. The Bible says, be angry and do not sin. I felt the anger consuming me. And I just had to pray and say, Lord, how do I handle my anger over this and not sin? And I just felt the Holy Spirit say, well, you can channel that into praying for those people because they certainly do need it. And so I did. I just started to pray for every person involved in that, the, the actors, the people who put it together. Um, they obviously have some idea what they've done, but they honestly don't they don't know. They don't really understand what they just did. And that they will stand before the very God that they are mocking someday. And what an absolutely terrifying thing that is going to be for them. But the reason I bring that up is this. The grace and the mercy of God is so incredible that if any one of those actors on that stage 
and, and, I, and I know, I know all the things. Oh, it wasn't the Last Supper. You know, you Christians are all, got your feathers all ruffled. It was depicting this painting from some like pagan gods, which by the way, I did look that painting up. It was painted in the 1600s and it is clearly a mockery of the Last Supper. So I don't care which way you went. It's still a mockery of Jesus and the Last Supper. There is no, don't, please do not gaslight me on this one. I know what I'm seeing and it's obvious that that is what is going on. But all that to say, any one of those people, if they were to have the Holy Spirit move in their hearts and they were to recognize what they had done and the blasphemy that they had just participated in, and if they were to repent sorrowfully repent for their sins and cry out to Jesus for forgiveness and salvation, do you realize he would instantly save them? Done. With joy. That's what he died for. When it says that God so loved the world, that's the world that he loved. Even when we were sinners, it says, Christ died for us. He died for every one of those people. The reason that it's so hard to get people to come to Christ is because the light of Christ shines on those dark acts and on ours, and it exposes them for what they are. And that's uncomfortable. And that's not something that people generally like or love. And that's what he's saying at the end of this passage. If, if, you, if you hate the light, you're going to hate the Jesus that provides the light. But if you're willing to humble yourself and say, I am a sinner. I do deserve the judgment of God. I do deserve his wrath. He had no reason to pay the penalty for my sin. But for reasons I'll never understand, his love was so great for me that he, he died for me, he took the wrath of God for me that I deserve. Wow. So if you're watching tonight, and this is kind of new to you, and you've been thinking all along, I'm a good person. Why would God keep me out of heaven? And all of a sudden, the light is going on and you're saying, oh, actually, I get it. Because when the light of Jesus shines on my dark heart, I, there is a lot in there that I, I'm not happy about. I'm not proud of. And I know it is an affront to him. Just know that God so loved the world that he sent Jesus, his only son, to die for you. So that if you would look on him in faith, that's it. You can't earn it. You can't work for it. You can't deserve it. You can't pay for it. You don't have the resources to do any of that. You can't because you don't have it, but he has it. If you look on him in faith and you cry out to him in the sorrow of your heart for your sins and ask him to forgive you, he is faithful and just, the Bible tells us, to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And there is, in my opinion, nothing in this universe more beautiful than a life that was lost in sin and headed for hell that Jesus comes along and shines the light on and that person repents and accepts Jesus as their Lord and Savior and God transforms them into a brand new person. That is to me the most beautiful, impressive, I'll never, ever, ever get tired of it scenario. And you know, when we are in heaven someday, you realize every single person there will have a story of some sort where you were when Jesus saved you. We'll all look around at each other and we'll say, I'm only here because of Christ. I didn't make it here on my own. I didn't do, I didn't do better things than you. I, I wasn't a better person than you. It was Jesus. It was all him. And we will spend eternity worshiping him and praising him for saving us from the wrath of God. Isn't that something? If you've not done this, oh, I hope you will. I don't even want to pray a prayer with you because I'm afraid you will rely on my words as special. And there are no special words. It's the content of what is in your heart. 
and in your mind. It's that repentant heart, that sorrow for sin. Cry out to Jesus in your own words, in your own way, and ask him to save you for eternity from your sins. And he will, and he will come into your life and be your Lord and Savior. Well, thank you so much for being with me. We will finish up chapter three, Lord willing, next week. And then I cannot wait to start chapter four of John with you. It is, as we refer to the story, the woman at the well, and what an amazing story that is. So don't miss out next Monday night, 9 p.m. Eastern time, Lord willing, as always. And until then, I hope you have a wonderful week, and I love you, and I pray for you, and I will see you again next Monday night. Have a good one.